Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for watching us online at weforum.org. Welcome to the final issue briefing of this summit on the Global Agenda 2015. Hard to think of a more urgent uh, and a more pressing issue than migration and the refugee crisis, which is the subject of this one. It's also very timely because we've actually moved this session. It was actually scheduled initially for Monday. We've moved it to Tuesday because there have been a number of workshops throughout the course of the summit, recognising here by bringing experts from all areas of, of society, all stakeholder groups, lots of different expertise and skill sets together to try to discern some actionable paths to, to um, hopefully lasting resolutions of this crisis. That's been the, uh, the, the attention, that's been the, a lot of the emphasis at this summit. I'm going to be joined by three panellists here. My esteemed colleague, Espen Bartaida, member of the Managing Board, the World Economic Forum. Khaled Koza, Executive Director of Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, in Switzerland. Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevEx, based in the USA. Raj is a member of the GAC on Humanitarian Response. Khaled is a GAC on Migration. So we have a good mix, again, from councils and a good emphasis here on working across councils to try to find ways forward. I'm going to start by inviting Espen to give us a few words by way of an update on the sessions he's been present in over the past couple of days. Yeah, thank you very much, Oli. And um, let me immediately say that uh, the main focus we've had over these days is about the opportunities and solutions. So we're not here just to deplore the sad state of affairs. We're here to see if we can contribute to finding solutions, just to start there. But before we go there, I just need to share with you a couple of words on the magnitude of the crisis as we see it. Because there's mul multiple crises that we've seen evolve over some time, which suddenly now came all together. And to make a long story short, there is the, 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 all the issues relating to fragmentation, division, collapse, uh, which had led to major humanitarian crisis and wars in itself, with an overlay on top of that about strategic competition between key players, that's key player in this region, and key players globally, who are actually not after who is not into solving it, but into maximizing their outcome uh, of uh, very violent conflicts. And this together has led to a major uh, displacement of people, millions and millions of people displaced inside the conflict uh, countries. That's where most people are. There are several millions in Syria alone, for instance. Then millions of people in the neighborhood who, who for many years have been living in refugee camps formal or informal or in other circumstances in the immediate neighborhood, and, um, and uh, probably believing that the crisis would be over reasonably soon, so it was a good choice to stay in order to prepare for it coming home. And what seems to have happened over the last months is that many of these people have got the impression that the crisis in Syria and the neighborhood of Syria is not um, ending. And, and there is no, no light at the end of the tunnel. We might as well get on with our lives. And what was a regional humanitarian crisis became a global humanitarian crisis. Most people are still in this region and not in Europe. But the way we've had these massive flows of people into Europe, even if they're numerically very limited compared to what countries like Jordan or Le Lebanon and so on have endured, it still has triggered a major debate on how to deal with this on the receiving end. And as you will have seen, that debate has not been particularly um, inspiring because some countries have said we can take more, others countries have said we can take none, and you have a deep division which is a normative division which is about how do we deal with people. So all these crises which left their individual life until recently are now coming together. And it seems to be long term. This is not ending anytime soon. It's going to get worse, not better, in the immediate future. So we will have massive amounts of people on the move, and the world needs to deal with that in the long term. Now, what we're promoting is a much better level of collaboration, collaboration between governments, humanitarian agencies and non-governmental organizations working in this space, and private business. We believe there is significant opportunity in that collaboration because there are experiences in the private side, in the business side, of how to deal with leadership, how to make decisions, how to deal with logistics, how to invest in fragile uh, situations that is of high relevance to the humanitarian community. And there are needs, but also experiences in the humanitarian community that could be shared to the business community. So what we're trying to do is to provide a space where there, these different worlds meet 
over a problem that they do all understand is maybe the biggest problem of our time. And, and that's, so that's really, really the purpose. And we're trying to find ways of thinking about very innovative approaches, go out of the silos, break the traditions of how, how this issue is dealt into compartments and think of it in a holistic way, where we also recognize the opportunities that comes out of technological innovation when it has to, for instance, communication, uh, the use of big data, uh, the, uh, the ability to have more cheaper and more effective payment systems that can substitute some of the delivery of goods with actual money so that people can spend money in their immediate vicinity rather than just receive things. And a lot of companies are thinking about how to, how to deal about that. And the last thing I want to say is that while we have massive fragility in the wars uh, in, in the Middle East, there's also fragility outside the wars. And we're increasingly also emphasizing that a lot of people live in dangerous, fragile situation, even if there's not a war in a traditional sense between two or more organized sides. And business, global and regional business, needs to learn how to deal with investment and business opportunities, even in difficult and complex situations, because you have pockets of growth coexisting with pockets of fragility in many parts of the world. And this happens all over the world. In the developing world, in the developed world, uh, east, west, north, south, there's more of this. So this topic, which is an epicenter in the current geopolitical you know, breakdown that we're seeing uh, in, in parts of the Middle East, has also a lot of global repercussions. Thanks, Esben. Khaled, you've written in the past few weeks on the, uh, the, the question whether we've reached a tipping point. So I want you to ex explore that a little bit and maybe give us an idea where we go now we've actually reached that tipping point. If indeed we have. Thanks, Oliver. If I could, before I come to the tipping point, let me just build on a couple of things that, that Espen said. We've just come from a very interesting session, again, in the spirit that Espen has, has spoken about for this entire meeting. Clearly, there's an upstream challenge, uh, root causes, Syria, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon. Clearly, there's a humanitarian crisis underway at the moment, not just in those countries, but also in Europe as well. And clearly, we shouldn't underestimate the role and the responsibility of the state. These are signatories to the 1951 Convention. They have a, a legal obligation to protect and assist refugees. But what we've just come from is a workshop that took a different perspective. Rather than looking upstream, we look downstream. A million refugees at least have arrived in Europe. We're sure that more are coming. They need to be integrated. They're not going to go home. We need to tackle the downstream challenge as much as the upstream challenge. We think that if effectively managed, and that's a very big if, but if effectively managed, this can be an economic opportunity as well as a humanitarian crisis. There is the potential for generating a talent pool. There's potential for plugging some of the demographic gaps that exist in Europe. There's a potential for filling some of the labour market gaps that exist in Europe if we can manage this correctly. And thirdly, rather than just focusing on the state, as did Espen's group, we focused on the role of business. We think that the private sector has a genuine role to play here in beginning to try to match supply and demand, in beginning to try to make sure that we get integration right downstream. So that was just an addition to, to Espen's point. The tipping point, uh, Oliver, I wrote a blog for the World Economic Forum a few weeks ago wondering whether we're reaching a tipping point around asylum seekers and refugees in the European context. I identified three reasons why I think that might be the case. Mm. Firstly, and this echoes something Espen just said, for the first time in my experience working on these issues, asylum seekers and refugees are voting with their feet. They are no longer putting up with staying in Syria or staying in neighboring countries, even though those countries are doing a great job to try to protect the system. They are saying, whatever your policies, whatever fortress Europe tries to throw at us, however big the walls you are building, we are coming. They're voting with their feet. That's something new. A second aspect of what might be a tipping point, and I haven't seen this really in the last 20 years or so, is that Europe's citizens are responding positively. You see great examples of individuals housing, providing food, providing shelter, helping people cross borders in their cars, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, there's a backlash, and of course, there's still a, a large group of people who have anti-immigrant, perhaps xenophobic perspectives. But I've seen a citizen's response that I haven't seen before in the European context. By the way, Oliver, for many years, many European governments have said, we will not accept more migrants and refugees because our public doesn't want us to. I think the public is now saying, please don't use us as an excuse. We want to help, we want to look after these people and do what we can to assist them, so please don't use us as a justification for your policies. The third tipping point or, or aspect that I spoke about, and this was written a few weeks ago, was really effectively to celebrate Angela Merkel's stand on these issues. I think it took incredible political 
bravery and leadership to stand up in a, a continent that is still really riven with anti-immigration sentiment and to offer to resettle 750, then one, and now 1.5 million people. And I think perhaps there was a tipping point in terms of Europe's political response. Now, four weeks since that article was published, where do we stand? I think um, voting with their feet, absolutely. We've just conducted interviews with a 1,000 Syrian asylum seekers and refugees in Turkey. Every single one intends to come. They're not going home. They don't want to stay. They're moving. This number will continue. So that part of the tipping point, I think, will continue. Citizens, well, I think at the moment we still have a positive response from many citizens in Europe. There may be a backlash. Once the realities of the challenges of integration kick in, once we realize that it's difficult to give people jobs, once schools get crowded, once there are temporary spikes in waiting lists for hospitals and so on and so forth, we may have some backlash. But I think at the moment, citizens are still responding positively. Where I'm most disappointed is in the political response. Mrs. Merkel stands, I think, as a shining light in this particular uh, area in Germany. But again and again, we've seen European countries, either individually or collectively at the European Union level, union level failing to match Mrs. Merkel's ambition. So I think the tipping point is still here, but it's the states that are letting us down. Thank mm -hmm. you. And we'll have time for questions, hopefully, too. But right, but before we do, briefly, this isn't the first humanitarian crisis or the first migration issue that the world has faced. What's different and what have we learned and what can we take forward from this? I think the biggest lesson, and it's not just about this crisis, as you say, there are many going on today at the same time. In fact, we're in a world, as Espen mentions, that it's really about global conflict in many ways. And I think the key issue here is that we have a humanitarian system that's fundamentally reactive. We look at the problem as it exists right now, and we try to scramble to raise the money and develop the systems to address it, as opposed to looking ahead and to thinking, how can we be more proactive as a, as a community to anticipate what's coming. Frankly, just in September, to put this in very human terms, the World Food Program had to take some 360,000 people in the region, in Jordan and Lebanon, off of their, their food assistance program. They had to say, we can't fund this anymore. They had to take another million or so and say, you used to get a dollar a day. We can now only give you 50 cents a day for food. Now, imagine that that didn't even matter to these people in terms of their actual day-to-day -day livelihood, or that for others, they didn't need that assistance Nonetheless, the message it sends, just the message it sends about what the humanitarian community values, right, what priority this place is, uh, is, is part of the reason, and, and we know there are many, but it's part of the reason why you see people saying, the time is now to leave the region and to try to get to Germany or somewhere else. So you know, we're in a moment when we've got to understand these issues are all connected. If we simply look at the, the system the way it has always existed and react to today's newspaper headline, we will miss the boat. We're like an old, you know, uh, beat up pickup truck, the humanitarian system barreling down the road. And we've got to somehow keep moving, keep funding the people who are in the camps, keep funding the programs like the World Food Program that are needed, but at the same time reinvent ourselves. And that includes, and I think this is a key lesson too, bringing in the private sector, having an open door. I think Khalid is absolutely right to praise Angela Merkel, but we should also praise the Federation of German Industry which has come out with a very proactive stance on seeing the refugees as a benefit to the country mm -hmm. and to saying we will create job opportunities. They understand, of course, there's a political reality, but they're looking for creative solutions to get people trained, to get them into the labor force. And I think that's exactly the sort of posture we need in this situation and, frankly, globally. We'll take questions. Gentlemen here, can you just wait for the microphone, please? Hi, uh, my name is Nikhil. I'm from Trends Magazine. Uh, and you know, I was just wondering what your assessment is uh, of the GCC's response to the crisis, because I know there has been uh, a big backlash and criticism about uh, you know, this region in particular doing uh, very little uh, and not being signatories to uh, the UN conventions. So. Well, I, I will actually be careful about giving advice on uh, specific country responses. But I think we're talking about here uh, a regional global crisis of uh, significant proportions, and, and I think any government should look for what it can do, and whether what, what, that may be in different areas. But the, the most important thing uh, is actually to help to stop the conflicts. So if there is any initiative that is possible in order to get out of this, um, you know, the, the, the problem with a conflict like Syria, and it's not only Syria, but Syria is one example, part of it in Yemen as well, but let me say Syria, is that you know, some years ago, we had many crises generating humanitarian disasters, but they were, they were normally 
predominantly local in nature, and the international community was criticized for not doing enough to help. But it wasn't that they didn't want, they didn't want the solution. What's happening now is that key countries at the highest level, actually, they may want a solution, but not the same solution. So they're competing and using the poor Syrian people as the playground, in a sense, for regional and global competition. And, and that makes it significantly worse for those working in the humanitarian space, because there's also a politicization of the whole idea that this should be solved. And I think without you know, pointing in a particular direction, I think everybody who has anything to contribute to overcoming that should try to do so. Lady in the front row. Um, Hassan Gaid, a student journalist from The National. Um, now, most of the migrants and uh, refugees uh, came from the Syrian war and the Syrian uh, conflict. But what do you think about the migrants that came from um, drought and water shortage in other countries? How did water shortage affect the migrant crisis to increase? Thank you. Thank you. And it's, can I just say it's great to have student journalists here as well. I think the youth is the future. So thank you for being here. Um, I think you've put your finger on a very important point. Much of the, the, the attention in Europe at the moment is on Syria and the so-called Syrian refugee crisis. In fact, this is a mixed migration flow. The 3,000 people or so who have drowned in the Mediterranean trying to come from North Africa to Europe are mainly people from sub-Saharan Africa, Eritrea, uh, Somalia, Nigeria, and some of the North African countries. Even the flows coming through Turkey into Greece include Afghans, include Iraqis as well. So this is very much a mixed combination of people moving, as you said, for different reasons. Increasingly in the contemporary world, it's very hard to identify any single motivation that people move for. In very extreme circumstances, yes, people flee conflict or human rights abuse, but even there, they're also fleeing often to improve their lives or because their farms are becoming desertified. So often it's a real combination of factors that are forcing people uh, to move. You asked specifically about the climate change part of this. As my colleagues will know, there is a, there is a, a real challenge around this at the moment. We are expecting in the future, and we're not quite sure when, but in the future, not too distant future, large numbers of people to begin to become displaced as a result of the effects of climate change. At the moment, we don't have a legal framework in place to protect them. They wouldn't be defined as refugees. We don't have an equivalent status for them yet. And so there's a real gap that I think needs to be filled and is being filled uh, quite soon. But I think your emphasis on mixed migration, multiple origin countries, people moving for multiple reasons is the reality and, of course, poses a significant policy challenge. Some of these people are refugees and deserve to be protected. Others may be effectively irregular migrants and can legally be sent home. And, and distinguishing those two becomes very difficult. Raj, anything to add? Yeah, I'll just pick up there. As you know, we have about 60 million displaced people in the world, right? Displaced internally or international refugees. That is a high since the World War II. Um, and I think the most important thing to understand is look at the trend line. Uh, this is, looks as though it's not a one-time event. It's not a blip, that we're facing a future where climate crises mingled with conflict and the two feed off of each other are going to lead to massive numbers of people looking to move. And so if we don't think in terms of the long-term trend line here, if we don't address some of the underlying issues, the, f the states that are fragile today that could become the next conflict zone but aren't, if we don't invest in those and watch them carefully and play a critical role today, we may be facing a situation that's far worse. So this is not to say that there aren't great opportunities, but we've got to get proactive when we think of the, the combination of climate and conflict and how they work together. Can I just quickly add, Please, you know, it's not the first time in history, because in, in our history books, we remember that there were ages of massive pe people's movement. And we are now probably living again in a time of mass migration. And we can probably not stop that. We can maybe reduce it by dealing better with regional and global conflicts. But we also have to internalize in our political systems everywhere that this is a reality. It's not going to go away. Let's turn it into an advantage. People is not necessarily bad. People is good. You know, more people is more workforce. See how you can get the best out of it. Thank you. Now, we have two more minutes. I'd quite like to use every, every ounce of that time as, as possible to just get some more knowledge out of you. Looking ahead to the next 12, 12 months, if you could change one thing, what would it be? What would you like to see happen? Raj, let's start with you. In the very short run, we need to dramatically increase funding, as you would expect, because if we don't do that <clears throat> and we continue to cut benefits for people who are on the move today, we know what will happen. We can see the trend. It's very clear. So countries that are thinking we can wait, we can see what happens, we can play the long game here, this is not going to work to anyone's favor. We can't close our eyes to it. So in the very short run, we need to do that. But what I would urge is that at the same time, 
we're redoubling the traditional efforts that we also try some really new approaches. I think there's an opportunity here, it's a thin silver lining, but there's an opportunity here for the countries in Europe that have sort of woken up to this crisis in the short run to develop new policies, new approaches, both to the region and to the way they think of and handle refugees that can address this into the future. Cut it. Um, in two words, political leadership. Uh, I, I am concerned that going forward, once the realities and the challenges of integration become more apparent to individuals in our countries in Europe, then this anti-immigration, xenophobic, rather toxic debate about migration will simply magnify. This is the time for political leaders to stand up and try to guide their citizens and control their media and make sure that we're having a sensible, objective, evidence-based debate. And by the way, I think there's also a role for business leaders. I think business leaders need to also stand up and make that statement very clearly. And I agree with both uh, Raj and Khalid. This is a test for humanity, and it's a big one. It's a difficult one. Let's see how, get, how well we deal with it together. And just add that, in addition to all this, much better cooperation regionally and globally to actually start addressing the main root cause, which is the continuing war in Syria. Because they, we, we can treat the symptoms, but we really have to deal with this in a way that that can stop and people can start rebuilding their lives where they originally came from. Funding, policy and business innovation, leadership and tackling the cause at its root. Thank you very much for joining us here in the audience. Thank you for watching us online. Thank you for our panel. Wishing you a very successful end to your summit and hope to get you back next year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.